Hello everyone. So, if you recall that we are doing uh, phase change heat exchangers and in that for last a number of <coughs> uh, classes we are considering condensers and condensers we have started with surface condensers. In a surface condenser condensation takes place outside the <coughs> outside the tubes uh, the condensation takes place the vapor condenses outside the tube through the tube the coolant is passed. Okay. So, surface condensers are generally liquid cooled condensers and many of the surface condensers are of saline tube configuration and they constitute a very large number of con condensers uh, used in uh, power plant, used in process industries and obviously in other industries also. <coughs> and, uh, but that is uh, not the only configuration of condenser. There is another variation which is <coughs> which is uh, if we come to the uh, present slide title slide uh, condensers with in tube condensation that means inside the tube also condensation may take place and this process is known as in tube condensation and there could be a large number of heat exchangers with in tube condensation. Uh, here in this figure I have shown a vertical tube vapor is flowing in the downward direction and condensation is taking place on the wall vertical wall of the tube. So, this is uh, simply a uh, uh, an example of in tube condensation. So, in tube condensation if these vertical tubes are there, there are in fact vertical condensers where in tube condensation takes place and uh, inside the vertical tubes uh, there will be uh, condensation and in the cell side there will be coolant this kind of condensers are there. Vertical tube and the type of configuration which I have shown is very good because uh, the uh, gravity is helping to drain out the condenser. In fact, whenever we think of uh, film wise condensation, <coughs> so then the film drainage is one of the issues and the film drainage is best done by gravity. So far that is the best method. Here in this particular case what we can find that liquid is draining in the downward direction which is good. At the same time vapor is also flowing in the downward direction. So, vapor will push the liquid in the downward direction this is good. In some cases there could be uh, different kind of a design that means one can have the um, vapor going in the upward direction, but the condensate has to come in the downward direction. So, that kind of configuration though in some design it is there uh, it may give some problem. A large number of condensers allow condensation of vapor inside uh, the tube. Air cooled condensers are examples where your um, air cooled condensers, uh, there are large number of air cooled condensers where in tube condensation takes place. Of course, the vertical tube condenses, condenser, whatever I have told, the example which I have given. Uh, this is uh, probably from a cell and tube heat exchanger where cell side there will be some liquid, but there could be air cooled condenser particularly in refrigeration and air conditioning uh, <coughs> air conditioning uh, industry there are many air cooled condensers many many air cooled condensers uh, we are having in an automobile in a car the uh, <coughs> air conditioning system is there and the condenser is air cooled condenser. And if it is air cooled then outside fluid is air and tube side fluid is the condensing refrigerant vapor. If it is condensing refrigerant vapor then obviously, you can understand that it is in tube condensing condensation taking place. Condensation inside the tube is much different from condensation outside from outer surface of a tube the film is drained by gravity. Gravity drainage of condensate is possible for vertical configuration as I have explained. However, the condensate film becomes thicker as it flows down. Okay. 
so as the condensate film be becomes thicker so it will choke the passage for <coughs> vapor flow and uh, the um, if the uh, condensate flows in the downward direction and vapor flow is in the upward direction then it will provide some sort of a counter flow between the condensate and the vapor but there are whole lot of heat exchangers where horizontal tubes are used for uh, the condenser uh, horizontal tubes are used and the the uh, vapor is inside this horizontal tube so in this case also removal of condensate is needed and generally with the vapor shear we try to do this okay there will be enough pumping head uh, uh, supplied to the vapor so vapor will push the liquid because it is horizontal we are not getting any advantage from the gravity <coughs> next slide if we see this shows the flow diagram in a horizontal tube uh, let me explain what is happening so here your th this is the direction of flow so let's say this is the tube and through the tube vapor is coming let's say vapor is coming in the superheated condition so then it becomes saturated and after that if cooling takes place so vapor uh, um, uh, produces condensate there will be droplet of liquid condensate and there will be film at the wall so here it is totally vapor and here we will have vapor layer outside inside this liquid sorry liquid condensate layer outside uh, and that means at the periphery of the tube and then the droplet of liquid that will be in the core we can have this kind of a configuration and in case of uh, in tube condensation inside a tube gravity plays a very important role and due to gravity the heavier fluid that is the condensate that tries to occupy the bottom side of the clue uh, of the of the tube and it is called stratification so then the vapor and um, liquid they will occupy different parts of the tube at the top side there will be vapor and at the bottom side there will be liquid so this is what we can see and ultimately it will be totally liquid so here we are um, uh, showing some sort of a some sort of a configuration where at one side of the tube superheated vapor enters and from the other side of the tube subcool liquid goes out and obviously the cross sectional view of the um, of the tube at different axial location will be given by this controlling force here the shear force due to vapor that will be important here the gravity force is important why gravity force is important because we have got stratification but obviously if the liquid has to go out of the tube then there will be pushing from the other side and the liquid will go out then flow pattern it is single phase vapor this is annular dispersed flow inside the core there are dispersed liquid droplet and at the periphery of the tube inside of the tube there is annular film then annular wavy so there will be wave formation there will be slug or plug or in some times we can get eccentric annular kind of film distribution and after that we will have a single phase liquid condition of the fluid here it is superheated in single phase here it is condensing uh, maybe the vapor is superheated then this would be by this time the liquid will be saturated in two phase condition and after that it will be subcooled condensate so in a horizontal tube this can take place i, I was giving the example of the air con, uh, sorry of the condenser of a refrigeration plant or air conditioning plant so there in many cases <coughs> liquid will enter in the uh, superheated condition 
and come out either in the two phase condition or in the subcooled condition it can come out. So, such a great variation of uh, phases will be there and such a great variation of flow regimes will be there. Now, if we consider the um, outside tube condensation uh, just to recap uh, just to remind you what was the outside tube heat transfer configuration. So, this was the tube and on outside we had condensate film and then the condensate film was grating drained sorry. like this. So, condensate film will get thickened up as it moves down both side it moves down. So, you see we could have and this film is thin this also we have to remember that this film is thin. So, at this film is thin nacelled conduction sorry nacelled film condensation theory it assumes that it depends the, the uh, heat transfer is uh, uh, mainly due to conduction and it depends on the temperature difference. Let us say this is T V on this side and let us say this is T W on the wall side. So, the heat transfer rate of heat transfer that is dependent on your this is your T V and this is T W. So, it is dependent on T W sorry T V minus T W vapor side temperature will be higher. That is one thing and analysis was simple only we are getting this kind of film condensation. So, uh, uh, there is no other geometrical configuration. So, this was simple, but in the present case we can see that there are different kind of flow regimes. So, if one has to take care of this one, so obviously different kind of flow regimes has to be considered which is not very easy to do. Okay. Some hints I will give regarding the design as we proceed, but today at least let us understand what is the difference between in tube condensation and condensation outside the tube. What are the critical issues of in tube condensation? So, let us understand those things. If we go to the next slide, then what we find that Suppose, at the initial phase uh, we have got kind of uh, annular and then uh, the annular configuration has changed because at the bottom there is due to stratification some amount of liquid has come. So, the actual configuration of the um, condensate film distribution inside the tube like this inner core white portion is the vapor in that there are small small particles uh, which are the particles of the condensate and then if we idealize this then left side we can see the idealized representation of this kind of condensation. So, up to an angle phi where phi starts from the top we can see that there is a distribution of film and it is basically film condensation there is a distribution of film. The film has become uh, gradually thicker and thicker as it should be due to uh, collection and then beyond phi what we can find that there is a flooding of the tube with liquid. Okay. So, there is a flooding of the tube with liquid. So, <coughs> uh, if this is the situation we can try to calculate the uh, heat transfer by some sort of um, by incorporating the physics of the problem. So, what we can see that there are two regimes, uh, there are two regimes up to this sorry let us take some other color oh. up 
to this there is this thin film. So, up to angle phi we have got one mechanism of heat transfer and then below. So, uh, top there is one mechanism and bottom there is another mechanism. So, that is what has been written on the other side. The total heat transfer coefficient if we have to take average. So, up to phi we have got some sort of a heat transfer coefficient uh, and uh, on the other side we have got some heat transfer coefficient h b and then again this h phi should be taken as average heat transfer coefficient in the top portion and h b should be taken average heat transfer coefficient in the bottom portion. Now, this goes without saying that as this portion is totally flooded with refrigerant, so there will not be much of heat transfer. So, h b can be neglected. So, in that case our life becomes little bit simple uh, without uh, occurring much without committing much error and then h total is given by this kind of a formula. Obviously, it is dependent on uh, phi and we have to um, find out the average heat transfer coefficient. Now, <coughs> the average heat transfer coefficient we can find out with the help of Nusselt, co uh, Nusselt condensation theory and uh, then the from the Nusselt con condensation theory we get this kind of a formula which is which you are familiar with this form you are you are you are familiar with the form. So, here also you see it is dependent on delta t uh, because the temperature difference in Nusselt uh, equation we take that uh, heat transfer is mainly by conduction. So, this this thing comes. And then there is one f phi f is a function of phi depending on flow rate uh, and we get uh, f phi by this kind of an equation which is valid for this region of angle. So, that is also given what uh, region of angle it is valid. So, basically then I know the average heat transfer coefficient which is a function of phi the functional relationship has also been given and the validity or range of validity that has also been given. So, I am in a position to find out what is the average heat transfer coefficient. <coughs> now, let us go to the next slide. So, next slide we get the total heat transfer coefficient, but here you see we have brought a new parameter which is nothing but this epsilon. This epsilon is nothing but this is this parameter we have brought and uh, this is nothing but your this epsilon is the void fraction which is given by this formula. <coughs> Uh, and uh, annular or bubbly flow. Uh, so, this formula is for annular uh, or bubbly flow in this region the heat transfer coefficient can be calculated from another kind of a formula it has been given. So, when there is a stratified uh, uh, condition which I have shown in the another uh, the previous slide. So, we can calculate the uh, H total. <coughs> H total means considering both the bottom side and the top side. Of course, bottom side heat transfer we have neglected. So, average heat transfer coefficient we can calculate and <coughs> here we are using some uh, <coughs> void fraction and with the help of void fraction we can do this calculation. There are uh, for other flow regime what we do? Uh, we, we, we try to take some sort of semi empirical formula and in the semi empirical formula what we can do you see some Reynolds number, Prandtl number based relationship we try to use. 
and from there we try to find out the heat transfer coefficient. So, this is one kind of recommendation, but we will use some other uh, correlation and with that which is most commonly used for um, 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 condensation heat transfer and with that we will try to solve some sort of a problem. Uh, if you problem I mean one problem at least we will try to solve may not be as rigorous as the previous problem, but at least in tube condensation how one can take care of. So, that we are going to discuss. So, what we have got so far from the discussion that as in many heat exchanger condensation takes place outside the tube in many heat exchangers uh, condensation takes place inside the tube. In tube condensation is difficult to analyze compared to um, condensation outside the tube <coughs> because there could be different kind of flow regimes and uh, mainly we have to depend on correlation. Outside tube we could have uh, depended or we, are, we could have relied on the analysis which has been given by Nusselt by modifying this analysis we could have done the prediction of heat transfer coefficient, but the same thing is not possible in many cases in case of in tube condensation. Some effort has been made uh, this is the kind of thing where we still try to continue with your Nussel kind of correlation or Nussel kind of analysis is like this that we try to <coughs> idealize the inside condensation of the tube like this that there is a thin film and here to some extent Nussel correlation can be uh, adopted. But problem is that we do not know exactly how long this, this Nussel correlation can be adopted because how long will this typical type of flow regime will continue. So, this is one aspect which we have to take care of <coughs> all right. Here then there are other flow regimes bubbly flow, plug flow etcetera. So, plug flow, bubbly flow uh, and annular flow these three are the three main type of flow in case of our uh, in tube condensation. And uh, some people suggest that flow regime based heat transfer calculation should be there, but uh, at the same time um, the flow regime based calculation are cumbersome. So, one correlation which will suffice for a large range of operat operation or large range of operating condition that kind of correlation will be good and we will gradually discuss that kind of correlation. Before that let us <coughs> go to the next slide. Here we get some comments on in tube condensation after that we will see what kind of correlation etcetera can be used. What are the comments? The condensation in horizontal tube may involve partial or total condensation of the vapor. What does it mean? It means that in most of the condenser we will find the uh, vapor is entering in superheated condition with different degrees of superheat. Then it will condense and go out of the tube but in many cases it, it may go out as uh, saturated or subcool liquid in some cases it can go out in the two phase condition it, itself. So, it could be total condensation or it could be partial condensation. Okay. So, that is one thing in many of the uh, refrigerating condenser we will find this not only that what happens in refrigerating condenser the <coughs> refrigeration, uh, refrigeration plant or the refrigeration cycle 
does not always operate at the same operating point. There is change in operating point also. Let us say, <coughs> let us say the condenser is air cooled and we are cooling it by forcing atmospheric air over the condenser in, in case of a refrigeration plant. But uh, the place where the plant is situated there, there is a large seasonal variation of temperature of uh, air outside. So, what we can find that depending on the seasonal variation of air temperature itself, we will have different kind of condensation in inside the tube uh, at different period of the year. So, this is one thing. So, the, the same condenser sometimes it may give that it is subcool liquid is coming out of it, sometimes it is uh, um, letting out I mean it lets out uh, this one the two phase mixture. Then depending on application the inlet vapor may be superheated, uh, the dryness fraction could be equal to 1 or dryness fraction could be below 1. So, even at the inlet we can have two phase condition. Hence, the condensation process path may first begin with a dry wall. So, this is also one important thing that the first part of the condenser could have a dry wall. Uh, I have uh, <coughs> discussed this point earlier, but let me because these are important let me repeat it once again that we have got a condenser this is the length of the condenser and this side is the temperature and uh, condenser means it is <coughs> giving away heat and it is getting cooled. So, initially subcool liquid has entered, then there will be evaporation sorry condensation and then sorry let me repeat it once again initially superheated liquid has entered uh, superheated vapor has entered and then condensation takes place and ultimately subcool liquid is going out of the condenser and then uh, one can have this kind of a thing also that means the coolant that is going on heating on this so, up to this we will have your superheated vapor then here we will have condensation and here we will have subcooling. Okay. So, this is what has been told in the uh, previous slide and uh, many of the practical heat exchangers are of this kind. Hence, the condensation process path may first begin with a dry wall desuperheating zone followed by a wet wall uh, desuperheating zone when saturated condensing zone then a saturated condensing zone and finally, a liquid subcooling zone. So, these many zones will be there and you can understand what is the what is the <coughs> challenge for a heat exchanger designer to design such a heat exchanger. Obviously, this point I have touched upon earlier, now also I am telling that these kind of designs are quite <coughs> challenging and uh, without iteration this kind of designs cannot be done. So, what we do and again I have told that let us say for a particular duty we have somehow calculated what is the desuperating zone, what is the two phase zone and what is the subcooling zone. But the duty 
or the demand or the heat load that changes. So, obviously, there will be shift of these zones. So, many cases by providing extra capacity of the heat exchanger, in this case condenser, we take care of this aspect. Otherwise, if, if our design is very tight, then it will be sufficient for a particular operating condition, for other operating conditions it will not be sufficient. Okay. Then uh, the next point, the condensing heat transfer coefficient is a strong function of local vapor quality decreasing as the vapor quality decreases. So, this is also one thing that it is a strong function of the vapor quality and it decreases as the vapor quality decreases. So, there are several reasons for this. One reason is that, that as long as vapor is there, then condensation is taking place and some amount of heat is transferred due to latent heat. So, obviously, its implication on heat transfer coefficient will be quite positive. That means, heat transfer coefficient will increase when there is condensation. But when it is reducing and ultimately it is producing uh, low, um, I mean sorry, the subcooled liquid, then the heat transfer coefficient will fall. Another thing, when there is a, when there is a um, uh, large amount of vapor, locally the velocity is also high. So, that increases the heat transfer coefficient. So, these two effects are there that uh, makes the heat transfer coefficient higher at higher vapor quality. The, <coughs> the condensing heat transfer coefficient is also a strong function of mass velocity increasing with the mass velocity increases. This point does not require much of explanation because more the velocity more will be the heat transfer coefficient. We will see that here also we will uh, the main mechanism of heat transfer is convection. So, in convection we know as the mass velocity increases or the Reynolds number increases we were having higher uh, heat transfer coefficient. So, obviously, uh, this is not difficult to understand or explain. Then <coughs> opposed to external condensation in tube condensation is independent of wall temperature difference. This is one important thing. Uh, as again let me go back and explain little bit. Uh, in nacelle condensation theory as the film form so, this side is T v sorry, this side is T v and this side is T w. So, Q that is proportional to T w minus T v. Heat transfer coefficient will be also proportional to this delta T w is a function of that means, heat transfer coefficient is a function of uh, T w minus T v. Rather here it will be T v minus T w because um, let me write it correctly otherwise you may have a wrong conception. So, this is T wall and this is T v and T wall is greater than sorry less than T v and heat transfer coefficient will be a function of T <coughs> v minus T w. So, this is for Nusselt's film condensation theory. Now, when in tube condensation is taking place and we have got very different kind of flow regimes, these are vapor and uh, this is liquid. So, here the heat transfer coefficient will not be dependent on your uh, wall temperature difference. So, this is a difference between your in tube condensation and um, condensation over the 
uh, over the outside surface of the tube. <coughs> Once we have explained it, let us go back to our previous slide. So, <coughs> except at low mass flow rate in stratified type of flow, we will not have uh, we will not have um, uh, any dependence on the wall temperature difference that is T sat minus T w which I have written as T v minus T w. So, the heat transfer coefficient will not depend on this. So, let us <coughs> we are towards the end of our discussion. So, let us recapitulate what we have done that in tube condensation is completely different from uh, the condensation outside the tube and uh, and and uh, in tube condensation is rather more complex phenomena due to the presence of different flow regimes. Heat transfer coefficient um, can vary quite a large along the length of the tube and we will see how to calculate it with the help of definitely correlations are to be used and what kind of correlations we will see in our next lecture. Thank you.